Sounds good? Okay. So to, today we're going to talk about the neutral atmosphere, uh, which is the thermosphere and the exosphere. It's about the same altitude uh, that Luca described yesterday. It's about from 100 to 1,000 to 1,500 kilometers of the sorts. It is important, well, let's say for two reasons. My main interest is actually satellite drag. So the neutral atmosphere is what causes satellite drag, uh, which makes prediction of satellite orbits into the future a little bit complicated. The other reason why it is important is, of course, that the neutral atmosphere, like Luca said, is by far the bulk of the particles in the, in the lower up to 1,000 kilometers atmosphere. So it's most of the time, it's a neutral atmosphere that moves the uh, charged particles. And so uh, anything you need to know about the ionosphere needs information from the thermosphere and mainly composition, which you uh, have access to mostly uh, through winds, which I, by the way, will not describe because it's a very complicated problem and we cannot really uh, validate, assess model quality on wind. So I will just give you, let's say, global state of the neutral atmosphere. So in this cartoon, what you see here is uh, also described already yesterday. Uh, you have the sun, the sun, the PUV drivers uh, excite uh, molecules at different altitudes. So oxygen, uh, molecular oxygen to ozone going down. You see these, this is actually the, the temperature profile, which I will show you in uh, more detail in the next slide. And here on the right, what you see is what, what happens at these altitudes. So typically, uh, troposphere level, 6 to 20 kilometers. Uh, we have airplanes, very high flying airplanes as well. In the stratosphere, you have uh, weather balloons. Mesosphere, you have the meteors. So that's where most meteors, as well as re-entering uh, vehicles, burn up. And that's, so this is where typically where the, the meteor radars are measuring. Then we have the, the aurora, which are uh, around 100, 100 something kilometers. And above that sits the thermosphere and the exosphere. Exosphere is where the particles escape. And so this is the part where we have our satellites, our spacecraft in orbit, let's say above, usually above three, 400 kilometers up to geostationary, whatever. So here's this temperature profile again. We start at the, at, at the surface. Uh, average temperature at the surface, about 17, 18 degrees Celsius. Up to the first minimum, the tropopause at about 15 kilometers. Then instead of decreasing all the way up to, to the mesopause, actually have a maximum, which is called the stratopause. And this, this maximum is entirely caused by ozone heating. So this is the part where actually the ozone saves our skin. And this is the infamous ozone hole. Then you have the mesopause at about 85 kilometers. And from that altitude on, you see that temperature is uh, rising uh, with tendency to a value uh, at infinite altitude. These maximum temperatures, so here we are in the thermosphere, are between 600 uh, at low solar minimum uh, to about 14 and even higher uh, during solar maximum. In these boxes here at the bottom, you see the troposphere, uh, mesosphere, stratosphere, so the energy sources. So what gives the energy and the sinks, because of course we cannot have only energy input, we need some cooling effect, otherwise we would be uh, in a really hell hole. But so this is the part that uh, at the surface for us uh, heats the atmosphere. And these are, uh, so infrared radiation, evaporation of water is what cools at the lowest altitude. You will have the slides, so I'm not going to read everything that is on here, because these are th not the, the spheres that I will discuss here. Uh, like I said, I will mainly discuss the thermosphere and exosphere. And for a thermosphere, you have these energy sources. So there, there are a lot more. So we have, as described yesterday again, we have the absorption of EUV, uh, 2200 nanometers, so that's extreme ultraviolet. And, and then we have also a part in the ultraviolet. We have the joule heating effect. Uh, joule heating, so that's the physical effect of uh, when you pass a current through uh, an electrical conductor, you produce heat. And so that's what's happening. You have 
the upper atmosphere is charged, it heats, and so you have a heating effect of the atmosphere. And that's why at the uh, high uh, latitudes you have this overall heating. And the dual heating is, is like I said yesterday, responsible for this uh, high gas temperature. And these high gas temperatures uh, then heat the background neutral species, so it's a very indirect effect. So we have the electrons are heated, uh, and then through a large number of collisions, finally the neutral atmosphere is heated as well. And so that is happening all at the high latitudes, which is then, with some kind of time delay, redistributed down all the way to the equator. And that is what makes things difficult because you have a heating effect here, and then you have to try to model, like, with some kind of delay, how it redistributes. And this redistribution is actually through the form mostly of waves. Um, one of the other sources, one of the, let's say, the, the only source coming from below, so from the, from the uh, stratosphere, mesosphere mainly, are these upward propagating waves. So through these heating sources at lower altitude, waves are uh, produced, these propagate upwards, and these then break, mostly here at, uh, at, the, meso at the turbopause, mesopause, and so this heat is being redistributed at the, the bottom of the thermosphere. So we have a little, but it's a little bit. Res with respect to the EUV heating, it's, it's a just a few percent. But there is a little bit of heating also coming from the bottom side of the atmosphere. Now we have the sinks, so we have uh, conduction into the mesosphere. That means so you have heat coming from the thermosphere re-radiating below into the mesosphere. And then you have the, the sinks, which is infrared cooling. So we have uh, carbon dioxide, nitric oxide cooling. So that is the excited state that re-radiate uh, out into the cosmos. This was shown also yesterday. So what is this uh, solar radiation absorption? As Lucas showed, we have a maximum rate sitting at a specific altitude, which is a function of, of course, um, atmosphere constituents. If it's very thin, um, then the absorption is very low. If it's very thick, everything is, pen is, is absorbed, so the penetration stops at some point in time. So we get this typical maximum absorption. And this absorption maximum is around 120, 160 kilometers, so in the lower thermosphere. So the state of the upper atmosphere um, in general, so the, the, the hydro is, is hydrostatic equilibrium. This is very important, hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, describe, I'm going to read this, the ECMWF statement, describes an atmospheric state in which the upward directed pressure gradient, so what you see here, the pressure, is balanced by the nearly downward directed gravitational pull of the Earth. This balance is fundamental to the maintenance of the Earth's atmosphere, and on average, the Earth's atmosphere is always very close to hydrostatic equilibrium. That's, so that is important, because if you would not have this equilibrium, then everything would either, through the, through the pull of gravity, would either sit on the surface, or everything would escape. So this is what keeps you actually in balance. You will hear, or you will read in some papers, that, well, hydrostatic equilibrium is not a good... Uh, state to model the atmosphere, and so we need non-hydrostatic uh, modeling. Which is true if you go look at very, very small scales. So depending on the scale that you're looking on, overall the atmosphere is approximately in hydrostatic equilibrium. If you're going to look at spatial scales of kilometers, then it no longer is. Then you have a specific heating effect, and then of course you have effects where this force is no longer exactly offset by that force. And if, so if you take very large scales, hydrostatic is a good state equation. If you have a, try to have, uh, like a meteorological model, which is trying to model things on the order of hundreds, hundreds of meters to a few kilometers, then you need the non-hydrostatic core to take into account these kind of effects, which is extremely complicated due, due to the fact that, well, like I said, you, you must make sure that everything, the physics do not like go out of hand. And secondly, there is a big problem with CPU time. The, the, the CPU time is not at all comparable when you go to non-hydrostatic core. 
the derivation um, of these equations is given like in, the, in what I call appendix one, so you'll see that in the presentation at the bottom. But hydrostatic equilibrium leads uh, to these state equations for pressure, the number of particles, and, and density rho. Just concentrating on, on rho, so the density rho of a particle I, which is, can be any of these. So you have partial densities, you have the partial densities of helium, oxygen, molecular isolate. And each of these molecular and, and atomic constituents has, like you see here, its own exponential decay in density. So everyone has its own uh, vertical profile. That is uh, more easily uh, understood here. So uh, this is the scale height. So uh, the scale height h, which you compute in this way. So a scale height is a general way just to uh, describe how uh, some uh, value fades with altitude. So in this specific case, h is when does density decrease by a factor e. So when is it 1 over e? 1.37 times smaller, how much kilometers above this first, that's the scale height. So Thanks to this hydrostatic equilibrium and molecular diffusion, you have, starting at the turbopause, about 100 kilometers, you have each individual constituent has a tendency to distribute vertically according to its own specific vertical profile. And that will show in the next figure. So this is also something Luca showed. So here, what you see is, it's a, it's a snapshot. You must uh, interpret this as a snapshot. So here you have altitude, density, and you have the partial densities, you have the total density, and this specific representation is for these conditions. So for this specific temperature. And this distribution, as you have seen here, here you have the mass, so the mass of all these constituents is different, so you see that the scale height of all these constituents will be different as well. So that is what you see here. So these, the, the gradients, the slopes are not at all the same of all the constituents. So for 750K, you will have this representation. If you go to solar maximum, you will have a different one. Uh, helium will come up, uh, molecular nitrogen will come up. If you go to solar minimum, uh, this will go smaller again. So that is how these, these uh, pictures look like if you change condition. So uh, molecular diffusion, so, or just diffusion, it's, it's the thermal motion, like any uh, fluid or gas, um, anything above absolute zero uh, has a motion. And so this, the, the, the speed, this movement is a function of temperature, viscosity, uh, the size of the particles, but when we are above the turbopause, so that when the atmosphere is very, very thin, molecular diffusion is very, very uh, efficient. When you go lower, and efficiency gets lower and lower because the density gets higher. And so other competing effects like turbulence and such make it so that we don't have uh, molecular diffusion anymore as the main uh, driver. And we get a homogeneously mixed atmosphere. So that is what we call uh, the homosphere. So anything below 100 kilometers is, let's, is a, a mixed atmosphere. And above, anywhere between 100 and 120, depending on the species because of the, the mass, these profiles start to separate. And we can actually model each individual species separately. And then when we go below 100 kilometers, we have to model, let's say, the bulk mass as one profile. It, can be considered, it must be modeled as one specific mass profile. So what are the heating effects? What, what did they actually cause? And, and how do we, uh, I will later see, how, how do we see that in, the, in our density? So first of all, uh, heating is, the main heating is due to solar EUV emissions. So anything between the the 20 and 100 nanometers. Uh, 
First of all, of course, you will have a day-night effect. Earth rotates, so there is always one side of, this, of the Earth which is illuminated. On that side, you have, of course, the, the, the ionization, photoisation, and, and much less on the other side. So that causes uh, a difference. This is also why we work on both longitude, but also solar local time. The received energy at a, at a location is variable as a function of season. Because of the uh, our rotation axis is inclined, depending on if you have southern or northern hemisphere winter, uh, one or the other hemisphere pole uh, receives all the radiation, whereas the other is in uh, total night. So that's what you see here. Um, Southern Hemisphere, summer, uh, and, and so we have this illumination and that causes these kind of effects. So you have a heating at very high latitude. Here in the Southern Hemisphere, you have the same thing, but of course in the Southern Hemisphere, um, summer. Now what you see is that these two are not equally big. So the energy deposition on the northern and the southern hemisphere is not equal. And that is because when we are just after uh, southern, uh, southern hemisphere summer, it is also where the Earth's orbit is closest to the sun. So perihelion is early January. So those sum up, and that is why we have a little bit more energy in the southern hemisphere than in the, southern, uh, than the northern hemisphere summer. So this heating, the EUV, so how do we actually uh, measure on the one hand and what kind of driver do we use, what can we use as a driver for the EUV in our models? Luca showed you yesterday also, you have sunspot number which is more or less anything on the sun that you measure is correlated with an 11 year cycle, but not any variable or, or, or measurement of the sun is equally representative of EUV, and that is what you want. You want something, you want a, a parameter that is closest in variability, that has the same signal as the EUV. Sunspot is relatively close, but by far not the best. Here you already see but this typical behavior, uh, solar cycle, so what you also see is that these are definitely not of same size. So we have very strong cycles. We haven't seen a very strong cycle in a while now. The last re really strong cycle was, was in the 60s. We had a, still a, a relatively strong cycle, uh, early 2000. But the last, uh, so uh, 23, 24, 25 now are, are relatively weak. So we have kind of lost the habit of working with data in a, in a strong cycle and all our models are also like based on one or the other uh, information, which is also uh, a problem. So what we do use in the models instead of sunspot number is, most of the time is F10.7. So F10.7 is a 10.7 centimeter radio flux. So it's not at all in the EUV. It's a, a radio measurement, so with ground antennas. And it is simply done, and I will show that tomorrow, because of course on the surface of the earth you cannot measure EUV. So you need something that mimics EUV, whereas you cannot measure that from the ground. And uh, this measurement started before we had platforms in space that could measure EUV from space. So uh, this started uh, in the space age, like 60s, 70s, you needed something. And so we had the ground antennas F10.7. That's why th these were used. And I will explain tomorrow why they are still used. So one other thing, um, you may wonder, well, you know, the solar cycle, um, for us in the visible light, infrared, there is essentially no variation over the solar cycle. It's, it's negligibly small. But that is not what excites the upper atmosphere. So photoionization, ionization is done, like I said, in the EUV. And the EUV is given in this part of, of this 
plot here, and this shows you the ratio of the maximum over the minimum of a specific ray in the spectrum. You see here, if you go to the, here in this side, we go to the visible light, which is already like in the 200 nanometers, we're very close to one. But here, in the part from, uh, typically here we have iron and helium. In the, the 20 to 50 nanometers, we have a couple of lines where you see that the strength from minimum to maximum is like a couple of hundred times stronger. So that is why the upper atmosphere reacts very, very strongly to solar cycle because these rays actually have a very, very strong modulation with solar cycle. This is just a pretty picture, just to give you an idea what happens when the sun gets active. So you, you see the sun from weak to high activity to high activity plus a coronal mass ejection. So you see already like this is in 30 nanometers. Uh, you see that it heats up, it gets, uh, there are more and more emissions in 30 nanometers. And here on top of that, you see a coronal mass ejection. So these points were taken like uh, at the maximum and uh, this picture here, uh, like here, uh, just after the minimum. So we have solar wind particles as well. So the second source of heating is we have the EUV, which is direct heating by um, EUV emissions. The second is the connection of solar wind particles that enter at high latitudes, so uh, in the caps. So we have the EUV emissions and we have the solar wind which enters, can only enter through the polar caps. So this, uh, the, this coupling though, the, the, the effectiveness, like was discussed yesterday several times, depends on the interplanetary magnetic field, so BZ, so the direction. So if BZ is negative, we can connect because actually the, the Earth magnetic south pole is here at our north pole, and that's when you get the connection. And secondly, it is a function of density uh, and speed of the solar wind. As said yesterday, uh, if you have like, you have a, a, a continuous solar wind and then you have shock waves and you have these CMEs and each time you have these shocks, they impact and depending on BZ, but also on the shock, you have or not a intense heating effect at these high latitudes, which can redistribute density to lower latitudes or to a much lesser degree. So in, in the following, what we're not completely correct, but when we're uh, in, in our models, what we say, uh, we have heating, we have drivers, which are representing EUV, so the solar activity. And then in our models, what we use, this solar wind, the connection with the magnetosphere, we call that geomagnetic activity for the same reason that, because in the past, of course, we couldn't measure solar wind, so we used, again, a parameter that is giving some kind of information on the state of perturbation of the geomagnetic field due to the solar wind, which is typically KP. DSD came a little, was used a little bit later. So again, it's, it's, it's an, 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 what we call a proxy, so it's, is a, it's a variable that behaves, that correlates very well, very well with this, uh, solar wind, but it is not the solar wind. So that you must always remember. It is always something which is close to, but never exactly the same. So this is a, a relatively old plot. I haven't been able to find a newer one that shows the same kind of, would give you the same kind of information. But just to give you uh, an idea of the total energy, so what is the, the contribution of, of the EUV and the solar wind, so the geomagnetic part, to solar, to upper atmosphere heating? So the total upper atmosphere heating is plotted here in black. These are uh, models and models with data simulation outputs. So this is the total heating received by the thermosphere. The, the, the gray line that you see just below is the EUV heating. So you see that most of the time, um, 
the heating is actually due to EUV. But on occasion, and you, that, that's the, the, the gray spikes at the bottom, that's the geomagnetic activity. So the, the dual heating effect, the dual power, on occasion all these spikes you see in here are what we call the geomagnetic storms. And so on these occasions, the dual power is as big as the EUV. This is particle precipitation, which is, uh, it is not negligible, but it is very, very small. And that we do not take into account uh, most of the time. Now, there are several types of models. So we, we try to represent the thermosphere um, in different ways. You can either do it like, uh, try it as a climatology. So what are the main features and the average features over a long period of time? Let's say statistical models. Or you can try to model them physically as accurate as possible. In that case, you're using the physical or first principle models. So these models, so they solve the th uh, 3D fluid equations, uh, typically with a one minute integration step, and on a latitude longitude grid, a grid of uh, a few degrees up to uh, five by uh, 15 degrees longitude. So depending on, on the size of your computer, you can get smaller and smaller grid sizes. And here also, so for these models, typically if you go to uh, one minute by one minute uh, to one, uh, degree by one degree or even smaller grid sizes, people start switching to non-dynamical cores because then at these very, very small scales, you can actually see effects very locally where the atmosphere is not in hydrostatic equilibrium. I'll give you a, a, one of the uh, most used models in the past and it's picking up again today is the TIEGCM, so it's the Thermosphere Ionosphere Electrodynamics General Circulation Model, which is maintained by NCAR and uh, still maintained by NCAR, uh, despite the fact that we're gonna, was gonna be phased out, is not going to be phased out. Um, the typical run is with a two and a half by two degree uh, latitude grid and 29 or more pressure levels. So you see this model actually does not start from the surface of the Earth, so it's not a whole atmosphere model. It's a general circulation model, but this model needs information at this altitude level. There is also a version that starts at 60 kilometers, but this particular first principle model needs information from the bottom, which is provided uh, by um, what was it? the GSWM. So the global scale wave model, another model, gives the information of, let's say, the, the, the state of the bottom side of TIEGCM. Then we have the drivers for solar and, and geomagnetic activity. Um, the solar EUV, they actually use a spectrum. It's a, it's, a, it's a, let's say from a few to 200 nanometers spectrum. Not full resolution, but specific lines, but well chosen. And these are then modulated by F10.7. So re remember again, this, so this means that it is not an absolute spectrum. The lines in the spectrum are correct, but the modulation of, the, of, of this entire part is done by F10.7. Again, I will explain why that is done also in, 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 in later slides. The solar wind uh, this time is not used as a, uh, we don't use this time a proxy, not a KP or AP as a geomagnetic driver. This time we have direct um, electric fields. So the, the reconnection of the magnetosphere at higher latitudes, that's, you have the electric uh, field and the precipitation pattern. And you can either use AB, which is the most sophisticated model you have. So it's a simulative mapping of ionospheric electrodynamics. So this is a model that actually assimilates data in real time. And so it corrects for all the model flaws, if you wish, to a certain degree. You can use a little bit simpler. So these are statistical precipitation patterns, the Weimar model, and HELIS is, is a statistical, pure statistical pattern, which is then modulated by KP. So you have some kind of pattern, and then the intensity of the pattern is, is again modulated with a proxy. So what are the advantages of such a physical model? Well, of course, you have realistic physics, or at least you, as realistic as possible. The variability is qualitatively 
Correct. So you have all kinds of waves and all kinds of small wiggles and, 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 and s small variations over the globe that qualitatively are correct. But if you look closely, if you're actually going to compare to observations, you see that this small variation exists, but it actually doesn't sit here, but it sits here. So it is always, most of the time, it is either shifted a little bit in time or a little bit shifted in place. And so the end of the story is that because if you have a very simple model which does not model these small variations and a very complex model which does but not at exactly the same place or time, in the end their performance is the same. One of the uh, disadvantages is it's very costly computation and it's also very very difficult to use. I'm, I don't know how to run it. You can tune essentially any parameter in the model and you can get complete bogus results without you knowing it if you're not an expert. One of the other uh, big problems today for us in orbit, turbidation, uh, orbit uh, determination is now we have no idea of the uncertainty. This kind of model cannot give you an uncertainty of, of the prediction. A second kind of model is what we call tabular or let's say when it's, when it's complete in time and space like a, a 4D data cube. Here are a couple of examples. Um, uh, the, let's say the, the best known example is actually not for Earth but for Mars. So you have Marsgram or the, the Mars Climate Database. So these are models that use a, GC, a, a physical model. They run it for a number of scenarios or low solar activity, high solar activity, uh, whatever on Mars, dust uh, scenarios. This gets archived and then you interpolate into these tables. So that's another uh, kind of model that exists. The advantage, of course, with respect to a pure physical model is that now this time it's fast and easy because you just have to interpolate. And it's very simple algorithm to, to interpolate into these tables. The disadvantage is, well, you have to truncate your, your first principles output to some kind of resolution. You have to make some kind of choice. If you take, for example, MCD, so the Mars model, gives you uh, one output per month, and you have to interpolate in time from one month to the other. So that is the kind of compromise you have to make. Otherwise, you can, of course, if you, if you give the full grid size, well, then you have a, a, a couple of, you have a tear of that model, and it's no longer usable again. Again, most of the time, we do not know what the uncertainty is. So we give a prediction of temperature or, 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 or density, but what is the uncertainty of that value? We do not know. Just uh, one detail here. So this model, and actually Marsgram as well, so that's kind of a hybrid tabular model if you wish. So we have a tabular model at the bottom, and then we combine it with an empirical model at the top. Uh, again, that's for uh, ease of use. Uh, typically, the, the, the empirical models are very have difficulty modeling the lower part, and the upper part is very easy and fast. And so, these kind of models were pragmatic and were built this way. And then, finally, we, we have the empirical model. So, the empirical model, so the examples you have DTM, which I'll uh, describe a little bit in detail tomorrow. And then, here you have a, a bunch of all other uh, empirical models. You give typically uh, a date a position, so latitude, longitude, local time, altitude, you give your solar drivers, and these models give you point by point a density composition temperature value. So that is a model which is optimized for calculation along an orbit. So when you're extrapolating your orbit, each integration step, you have your position, and you call your subroutine, and it gives you back a temperature and density. So these advantages are, it's very fast and easy, which is of course a precondition for use in orbit extrapolators. It's a very simple algorithm and it is robust. Uh, what I didn't say, the, the first principle models also can crash depending, if your tuning is not correct, your model can crash. These models do not. Of course, this comes at the price of the low uh, resolution. Uh, it's, it's a simple algorithm, so which means that your your uh, variability is a, a kind of a mean representation of the, of the atmosphere and so very local effects or very specific effects you cannot take into account. And it is highly dependent on the quality of the data. So these empirical models 
our statistical data fits to a database that represents the atmosphere as complete as possible. So if there are conditions for which you have no data, then your empirical model is like purely extrapolated and it can be very good or it can be very bad. On the other hand, we do know the uncertainty of these kind of models. They're of the order of, depending on altitude, position, or activity and such, between eight and 25%, one sigma for Earth. And so despite the weaknesses of these models, it is this model that is used in orbit uh, computations. Then we have the physical or empirical models plus data assimilation. I will give you just one example, the empirical model, because this is the only one that, that, that runs uh, operationally and is used operationally, which it has them, which is the high accuracy, high accuracy satellite drag model of the US Air Force. So it's proprietary. We do not have access to that, in to that information. Um, you have access sometimes on request for past events. So the advantage is the same that you have for either the, the physical or empirical model. Plus, thanks to the data assimilation, you now have high accuracy. The disadvantage is all, they're the same as well, but this time you have to make sure that your quality control of your data that you're assimilating in real time is actually making sure that you are not assimilating garbage. So your quality control has to be very, very stringent. The uncertainty is of the order for, for this model that has them, which we know very well, anywhere between three and 10%, so which is really, really very accurate. For the physical models, which is WAM IPE, which is now operational and running at NOAA, but not used yet in the orbit computation uh, community, we do not know. We're, we're trying to assess, but it's difficult. And of course, data simulation means that if you have no data, or if your data is very bad, your data simulation scheme fails and you have to fall back to some other kind of scenario, so fall back to the usual empirical model, for example. But to give you an example on how well this actually works, so here's Hasdem. So goes here in somewhere behind the, 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 the blue, you see the black, that's the observation. That's the, the, the Gotje satellite, about 255 kilometers. Red is the JB model, which is the model before data simulation. And blue is Hasdem, so that's JB plus data simulation. And you see that um, the values here, the performance, O to C is observed to computer ratio. So the observed to computer ratio, if it's one, it means that the observation and the model values are on average identical. So we go from a 12% offset with JB to a 0% offset. The precision, standard deviation drops from 10% to 3%. So that's what data simulation can do for you. So variability. I'll now show um, variability of, of, of the thermosphere like in, in space and time, what it looks like. Of course, it is a function of location. Um, we had already seen it is a function of, of altitude. So we have this exponential, exponential decay with, uh, with altitude. Then it is a function of uh, latitude and local solar time. It is also a little bit function of longitude, but longitude are, are much weaker variations. So the, the, the main variation is actually latitude, local time. And so this is a, an example, uh, this, this example of, of a density at 250 kilometers for northern hemisphere summer. So you see that the maximum of the density is sitting located uh, in the northern hemisphere. You also see that the maximum is not at local time noon. There is uh, a little bit of a delay due to the heating. It's not instantaneous, so it takes a little bit while, and it takes about two to three hours. So the maximum is typically around three local time in the afternoon. Again, season. So this is what happens due to this lighting from, from the northern uh, cap or the southern cap in, in, in summer. Northern summer, southern summer. So you see again here, uh, the maximum is sitting in the north with the maximum going down uh, about 40 degrees maximum. And uh, at this altitude, typically what we see 500, it's a little bit later, it's more like four o'clock in the afternoon, 4 p.m. And in the south, 
Um, you also see that it is a wider, a bigger maximum. You know why now? Just to give you a simple example that you can easily see this if you have density observation. So these are uh, densities from the Swarm A satellite. So these are red profiles. This is latitude. This is density. So here you see each time it's, it's an orbital revolution. It's the, the local time is, is, is noon, midnight. So what you see on this side here are the, the day side profiles and here are the night side profiles. So what you see here typically in July, you see this maximum here in the Northern Hemisphere as expected. Here we are 1 January and you see easily this, this seasonal variation in any kind of uh, accurate density uh, very, uh, observations. Of course, now we have the variability due to uh, the solar activity and the geomagnetic activity. We have this modulation with the 11-year cycle, and this will modulate, of course, your density. Same for, for geomagnetic activity. So his, this is daily KP. So you see, it's, this is a very active part of the solar cycle. So you see the variability is, is very rapid. And here we have then a, a, a big geomagnetic storm. So this is the Halloween storm of 03. And like I said, both of these are proxies. And so a proxy is a measurement that mimics variations of another observable. I will show tomorrow, I will show you exactly what, what that means and, and how we try to get the best possible proxy. Now, just to give you an idea of, of the scales, so what happens from solar minimum to solar maximum. Of course, this is a model prediction, but these are uh, quite accurate. It's, it's not like 100% offset. Like there may be like tens of uh, maximum 10, 20% errors somewhere in these profiles, but these are actually quite good uh, impressions of what happens from solar min to solar max. So here again, you have altitude, you have density. Here we have s solar minimum, the light blue profile. And then in the dark blue, you add a storm. So solar minimum here I've used um, like typically uh, F10.765, AP equals one. And for the storm, so it's a very, very big storm, AP 400, and it's a KP9, so that's the, the worst storm you can get. Typically at solar min, you see that density increased by anywhere between four and six. So that's the effect of density during solar minimum. Now you go from solar minimum without, solar, without geomagnetic activity to solar max. This is solar max, which was like typically uh, a few cycles ago, like cycle 21, so a very strong cycle, F10.7, 2.40. But if that happens, your density, the, the, the contrast between minimum and maximum is of the order from 15 at lower uh, altitude up to 90 at uh, about 700 kilometers. If on top of that you have this big storm again, then the, the contrast between solar minimum without any geomagnetic activity and solar maximum plus a storm, you're increasing density by up to more than 200. So this is what you have to take into account when you're designing a mission, and specifically when you're designing a mission, for example, with propulsion. So the solar cycle, you can also easily see that in the densities of, uh, that we have available. So at the top, those are densities from the CHAMP satellite. And at the bottom in blue is GRACE. And the solar cycle activity is here in, in kind of an orange. So you see that we go from maximum to minimum and back to the maximum again. So for GRACE, you can easily see that it very well follows this solar cycle variation. But for CHAMP, actually, it stays flat. And it can lead you in error, but it's very, very simple. Actually, this one stays more or less at the same altitude whereas CHAMP offsets the effect of the decaying uh, density by a decreasing altitude of its orbit. So that th those are things that you have to take into account. Seasonal variation. So this is at uh, 800 kilometers 
the satellite called Stella. So here you see that you have these annual and semi-annual variations. It's, of course, they're not clean annual and semi-annual because all you see here is mixed not only between seasonal, but all variations. So you have here the mix of seasonal variations plus solar activity, but still you can easily see here the seasonal variations in there. Solar rotation effect, same thing. The dotted line is the, the 81 day mean of F10.7 and then the, the, the solid orange line is the daily value of F10.7. So you see that on these occasions you have very, very strong solar uh, rotation effects. And at these occasions you see in the grays and the, and the champ density, you see the density spiking too. So there is also an effect of the solar rotation. You can clearly see the solar rotation in your densities as well if you know how to look for it. And then at the shortest time scale still, daily variations. So these are due to uh, simply the variations in, in solar energy input. So if you have here on the top line, uh, these are three days in 2023. Uh, here are your KP values. You see that on each line, your KP varies. These are each time per three hours. So you see that the KP input uh, varies a little bit. And here is your solar activity. And if you see that your solar activity is also not constant. So these variations also cause these smaller wiggles in the variability in your, in your density time series. And of course, these small wiggles are also due, uh, due to a superposition of tidal variations coming from below. That's what I said in, the, in, in, in the fir one of the first slides. There is a small input coming from, from the stratosphere uh, mesosphere. It's very, very small. Uh, these tidal components, you can compute, you can propagate to higher altitudes, you can see them, but they're, again, of the order of a few percent, so it's very, very difficult to, to extract them uh, accurately, but you can. And I have shown the, 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 the uh, equations and how you can extract these kind of variations, how you can see them uh, in, in Appendix 2. And then the fast variations, like we're going to the faster, faster. Now we're going to uh, variations of the order of hours to two days. So that's typically a solar a geomagnetic storm. So this is a, a storm November uh, of 2003. I'm showing this because it's, it's pretty big. So you get large effects. So what you see here are the densities on the night side profiles and the day side profiles for Grace and Chan. The black lines are uh, just before and after the storm. And then the colored lines are the density profiles during the storm. So you can see that typically on the night side, take grace, uh, your density increases from 0.5 to uh, maximum to four. So, so a factor of eight increase in density over that storm period. So that means over the period of, of hours to, to one or two days, you can have an increase in density that goes up to a factor 10. So we can localize these, these small variability uh, by some kind of, this is a very crude filtering, it's just using uh, detrending. So here we have latitude density. So this is a density profile from the CHAMP satellite. Th the observations, so the, the black are the raw observations. We're gonna compute the trend, so 59 points, it's just the blue line. And then if we subtract the trend from the raw values, we have a, a detrending filter. And so it gives you access, if you compute the residual as the difference between uh, the observation minus the trend, you only get the wiggles. And these wiggles then, depending on uh, the size of your window, uh, represent a, a certain spatial scale. In this case, if you're gonna subtract uh, 59 point detrended, you get access to wave-like activity uh, scales between 160 and 2400 kilometers. And so this is what you, uh, this is the, let's say the, the small variability, the fast variability you see over uh, an orbital arc of the order of at high latitude, plus or minus uh, 10, 20%, and at the lower altitude, most of the time between plus or minus 5%. You can also do that like, like statistically, climatology wise, if you do that for uh, taking all the data for CHAMP, 
and grace and we look at it per year. 2002, high solar activity. 2003, you see here where these snapshots are taken. 02, 03, uh, 2005, 2008 solar minimum. You see that these relative variation increase when solar is inversely proportional with the solar activity cycle. So when the EUV flux is very, very high, there's ver very s little uh, relative variations are very, very small. So we have very little small wave-like effects. But when the EUV, so when the heating from the EUV decreases, these effects get stronger. That is actually the fact that the impact of solar wind and from below, relatively speaking, gets more and more important. You can even, even more so easily see that here. The last four pictures were for quiet geomagnetic activity. This is what happens if you look at high geomagnetic activity. So you see here that you have, as expected, very high wave-like activity in the polar areas, but also in the nighttime. So you have high variability in the night side up to about six in the morning. Here again, you see this is where we have the most solar EUV heating. So here again, we have the minimum sitting in the local noon. So these kind of things also gives us some kind of a subgrid scale uncertainty of our empirical model. So this is typically the scale that we cannot model with the empirical models, but we know the kind of uh, uncertainty we have due to the fact that we are not modeling these wiggles. And the fastest we have, solar flares. So this is the only f one of the few flares that actually have a, a visible, measurable impact on, on, on neutral density. So this was again in, in 2003. This solar flare, <coughs> here's the flare, this is the CME. So this is the geomagnetic storm, 200 to 300% increase. And during the solar flare here, we have an increase over one or two hours of about 50%. This solar flare, though, was, depending on who you ask, was X27 or more. So that's one of the highest, the strongest flares ever measured. So anything even below X10, you will not see in your density. It will be too small to measure. So before we are like being uh, uh, bothered by flares or what, that we have to take into account flares into our models, statistically our database is very, very small. So that brings me to the summary. So like I showed, like solar heating is the main energy source for the main state of the, of the uh, thermosphere. So the main cooling, uh, molecular conduction and secondary is uh, radiative cooling, uh, mainly by uh, like, like uh, carbon dioxide, a little bit lower altitude and nitric oxide in the thermosphere. Main gases, uh, of course, as a function of altitude, again, I will show the meaning of that and the importance of that tomorrow. Oxygen, molecular oxygen, molecular nitrogen, helium at a little bit higher altitudes. There's a strong uh, variability uh, of temperature, wind, and composition in the solar cycle, season, local time, geomagnetic activity. So I haven't shown specific wind results because what I said, wind is very difficult to, to assess the performance of models. So I'm kind of, I'm not comfortable presenting wind results. So the seasonal composition changes are controlled by global winds, and there are no ones by photochemistry. So that is actually important information. If you want to improve ionosphere modeling, this is typically what you need to improve in the thermosphere modeling. And this is typically what we have very, very, very big problems with improving the wind part. So at low uh, latitudes, effects of upward propagating tides, planetary waves, and gravity waves are most important. Uh, still rather small, so we did a test with, with Wecamex uh, about a year ago. Uh, when we are measuring the, the impact at about 400 kilometers, it's plus or minus 2 or 3 percent. When we're getting close to the re-entry, uh, to let's say 150 kilometers, we see it increasing to 4 or 5 percent. And when we take a look at these very low altitudes plus very low solar activity, it can be up to 10 percent. That is also one of the reasons when you are computing a re-entry, 
and you will say, well, you know, where is this contact point of the satellite going to be? And they're always making huge mistakes, like they said it was going to re-enter here and actually re-entered over a different continent. It is also because we do not know what this uh, <coughs> variability at these, at these altitudes is. And finally, at high latitudes, heating from magnetosphere occurs in the form of uh, dual heating and precipitating particles. And like I've shown you, it's like on some occasions, on very severe geomagnetic storms, this can be equal to the solar EUV heating. And with that, thank you. So just after this, you have um, the, the appendix A1 and A2, and after that are the, all the, the paper references to everything that I've more or less discussed here. So if you want to have uh, more details on one or the other, uh, at the end you have also a full reference list. And like I said, also the, the part, the perturbations from below, the migrating, non-migrating tides uh, that are generated in stratosphere, mesosphere, and then upward propagated into the thermosphere, that part is discussed uh, in Appendix 2. So, are there any questions? <coughs>